I want to talk today about two very powerful women in the 16th century. It's kind of surprising in a way that there are powerful women in the 16th century. It seems very much a time when men controlled the society. But we will find some interesting examples of women uh, having uh, influence in this uh, early modern period. And one of the clear examples is these two very important queens, Mary the Catholic and Elizabeth the Protestant. Now, I'll have to do a little introduction first and talk about Henry a little bit and Edward. Okay. So just, just let me prepare you with a bit of background here. Uh, it won't take very long. Henry, as we saw, uh, left his wife, Catherine. He divorced, or technically he annulled his marriage with uh, Catherine and uh, married uh, Anne Boleyn. And then Anne also met his disfavor. He, he chopped her head off, as we saw last week. So then again, he married another time, uh, Jane Seymour, and finally he had the son he wanted. Uh, she died a couple of weeks later, um, so now he didn't need a son, but he still wanted a wife. So he married again, wife number four, Anne of Cleves, a uh, German princess, and uh, he'd never actually met her. She was kind of recommended to him by uh, one of his... Um, advisors. And uh, when he actually met her, he didn't like her. And so uh, he never apparently ever slept with her. He just said, oh, I don't like her. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have her as my wife. And a few weeks later, or a few months later, he, he annulled the marriage. He said, this isn't a marriage. This marriage, forget it. I don't like her. Send her back to Germany. I don't want her. Uh, so um, that was the end of wife number four. <clears throat> wife number five was a cousin of Anne Boleyn and she had the same uh, accusations. In her case it's more probable that there was some truth to it, that she was in, interested in other men. Um, but uh, whatever the truth, um, she met the same end as her cousin Anne Boleyn. She had her head chopped off. Notice that the, the women who get their, who get their heads checked off, chopped off are always English. He doesn't chop the head off the Spanish princess or the German princess. That would mean war. Okay? Uh, he chops the heads off uh, English, um, English uh, women that he marries. Nasty guy. Uh, so that happened in 1542, and then he married... Uh, Catherine Parr, who seems to have been quite a gentle uh, woman, who talked to him about religion. She, she, she followed the Protestant way. She tried to get him more uh, along the Protestant path. Um, apparently, they talked quite often about religious problems and things like that. And then finally, uh, he died. And she, she was still alive in 1547. She lived for several years after that. And uh, she forms part of the, the, the story that comes next. But when Henry dies, the first person who's going to become king now, or take the throne now, is obviously his son. Um, what happens? The son is going to inherit this kind of world. He's going to, under, uh, uh, he's going to have to deal with the problems and the, 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 the legacy, the... Um, sort of what he inherits, really, from his father. He inherits several problems. The first problem is uh, Henry's um, re relations to the rest of Britain. Uh, in particular, uh, Henry attacks uh, uh, Scotland. Uh, kind of strange because, you know, as we know, his sister was married to the Scottish king. Uh, why, why weren't they more friendly? He wasn't. Okay? Uh, he attacked Scotland uh, pretty hard. 
uh, with not much result. The result was, well, the, the, actually the only result was that Scotland then said, okay, if England doesn't want to be friends with us, we'll make friends with France. Okay? And that puts England in a difficult position. Enemy to the north, enemy to the south. All right? Uh, Edward had to try to deal with that. Um, so uh, this was causing trouble at the end of Henry's reign, and it was something Edward was, had to try to deal with. And the other problem was the economic problem. These wars that Henry liked so much were expensive. And uh, all that money that Henry VII, Henry VIII's father, had saved up for the country quickly just got spent. The country was getting into debt. Now, in, in those days, if you had, you know, like one pound of, of money, it was supposed to have one pound's worth of, of gold or metal inside it. If it was silver money, you know, today's money is symbolic. There isn't a hundred yen of, of, um, of metal inside this. This, this. this is symbolic. Okay? Um, but in those days, the money was supposed to be the exact value. Okay, so one pound meant one pound of gold. All right. Uh, what Henry started doing was he, st he started cheating on that. Okay, he started mixing the gold with other metals that was cheaper. Um, to, and, and this led to economic problems. The money got devalued. People, you sometimes see in movies people taking money and going, <coughs> fighting it. That's the reason. If it was gold, <coughs> oh yeah, that, that's, that feels like real. Because gold is quite a soft metal, you can, you can actually, with your teeth, you can, you can dent it. If, it's re if it was mixed with other metals, it would be too hard. Ah, ooh, that, that's not real gold, that's, that's mixed with something else. Okay? Uh, and that's the reason, uh, mixing the money in that way. And so Henry created an economic problem because people didn't trust the money anymore. So these were uh, the problem of having enemies in Scotland and France, um, economic problems in England. These were pretty big problems for, for um, Edward to try to deal with, plus the fact that he was only nine years old. I mean, he was just a little boy. So he had a lot of responsibility. Uh, and basically, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, solve these problems uh, during his lifetime. Um, he died when he was 15, and these problems were still kind of going on. So, um, yeah, he was just a little boy. Obviously, he wasn't controlling the country exactly, just by himself. So let's have a look at uh, a little bit. Um, he's, he's the boy king, <laughs> nine years old. And he's, he's king of England, but he's only really king of England in name. He's nominally king. The real control is uh, his advisors. Starts off with one of his uncles and moves on to somebody else later on in his reign. Uh, I won't go into details of that. But England was controlled by advisors. He did have his own feelings about some things. And one thing he was fairly sure about was um, religion. He wanted the Protestant church to be the church you know, to, that developed in his country. And so he started to introduce real reforms. Remember, Henry had split with the Pope, but he wasn't really interested in Protestantism very much. Sometimes he, he would go in that direction a little bit, but then he'd change his mind and go back to be basically Catholic, but... Um, it's, uh, we call it um, Roma ho nascino Roma ho shugi. Okay, so Ro we call it popery without the Pope. The Catholic Church, but without, it's like Catholicism, but it's just, the only thing that's different is that he didn't want the Pope. Okay, um, his son Edward had a, a Protestant mother and he uh, wanted to introduce proper Protestant reforms. Um, these names, again, if you're interested in the religion of that period, Thomas Cranmer, Nicholas Ridley, and Hugh Latimer were the big 
uh, reformers. And they were able, in, in Edward's time, they were able to make some real Protestant reforms to, to the church. Um, later on, they get burned to death by Mary. Okay? Uh, so these Protestant reformers, uh, later on, they're in big trouble because the church is going to go back to uh, being Catholic under Mary. But at this time, they're starting to introduce Protestant reforms. Um, priests are being allowed to marry. The prayer book is uh, being used in English so that inside the church, the, the service, the Misa, is in, uh, is in English for the first time. And a lot of Protestants came back to England uh, under Edward. But of course, Edward didn't live for very long. Um, you can see some pictures of, of, of that here. Uh, basically, open spaces like St. Paul's Churchyard, uh, places like, like this, uh, were where people would stand up and speak. And uh, people would crowd around and listen, and then other people, they'd go and tell other people, and the word would spread around. They didn't have newspapers, they didn't have television or radio, okay? That, that's how news and the information got around. Uh, the, the big, important people would stand up on that pedestal and they'd say what had to be said, political or religious, and other people would listen and they'd spread it around in that way. That was how news got spread around in those days. So I will come back to that uh, way of spreading news later on, but the basic picture here is Latimer, one of the main reformers, uh, spreading the new Protestant teaching among the people. And here he is again in a different, uh, a different context. Okay, the king there uh, listening to him. All right, this I think is at Westminster. Okay, uh, so this was uh, how uh, the teaching, the new teaching would get spread, basically by word of mouth. Of course, they did have books. They, they were able to print things. They would write down his sermon later on, and it, maybe it would be published later on if it was a very important one. Uh, so uh, they could also appear in print. But as I say, Edward doesn't last for very long. And we get Mary, the Catholic daughter. So this is where the pendulum swings right back again to uh, the Catholic religion. Um, she's sometimes known as Bloody Mary, which may be a drink that you, a cocktail that you order in the, um, when you go out for a drink in the evening. Uh, a Bloody Mary is uh, vodka and tomato juice, I believe. Um, and uh, it's named after her because it's got that, it looks a bit like blood. And she's best remembered for the deaths of uh, about 300 Protestants during her five-year reign. And yes, the way of dying was by burning. This was the usual punishment. Three hundred, well, it's a lot, I suppose. But in those days, you know, those were violent times. People often died. And uh, it, it was a violent period of history. But these 300 or so Protestants had a big, big uh, effect on how people thought about Catholicism after that. The English people would think about, oh, it was the Ijiwaru Mary, she burned people. Terrible thing to do. So this, uh, the number of people is maybe not so huge for a violent time. Henry VIII uh, killed uh, a lot more people than that. Okay. But uh, the effect that it had on people's imagination has been huge. So it's very important to, to think about that. Um, not just the number, but the, the, the kind of effect that it had on uh, English society. Um, sorry, what have we got here? Yeah. Uh, actually, after Edward died, he, 
he wanted uh, his cousin, who was a Protestant, to be the queen. And he named Lady Jane Grey as the next queen. Uh, this was very unlucky for poor Lady Jane Grey. She didn't want to be queen. She only accepted it, saying, oh, well, okay, if, 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 if my cousin wanted me to, I suppose I should. Uh, and it was, as I say, a very, very unlucky thing for her because she was challenged by Mary, who said, no, no, it should not be uh, Lady Jane Grey, it should be me. And so Lady Jane Grey was put to death at the age of 15. Okay, uh, this was what life was like in those days. This poor girl uh, didn't want to be queen. Uh, she was challenged by uh, Mary uh, for the right to be queen, and uh, Mary proved to have more support. She proved to be stronger, and so the loser had to be killed. That was life in those days. So then, of course, once Mary becomes queen, uh, we've got a Catholic country, and uh, it's the, the Pope is, is you know, the, the head of the church again, and we're back to uh, the situation as it was you know, in the 1530s, uh, sorry, in the uh, 1530s, before um, Henry had his um, divorce, before England separated from the Church of Rome. It went back to being Catholic. And because Mary was Catholic, she didn't want her half-sister, Elizabeth, to, to become queen after her because her half-sister... Remember, Mary is the daughter of Catherine, the Spanish princess, Catherine. Elizabeth is the daughter of Anne, the princess Anne Boleyn, uh, the one who had her head chopped off but who came from a Protestant family. All right, so Elizabeth had been brought up Protestant. Uh, Mary was Catholic. But they were half-sisters, and as children, they played together happily. They seemed to be, you know, quite close. Mary, uh, logically, you know, in the usual way of things, just like Lady Jane Grey was killed, uh, Mary would have killed probably Elizabeth. But, but they were close, and she didn't. And also, Elizabeth was very, very careful. She thought, oh my God, I could, I could get my head chopped off so easily here. So, oh Mary, it's so good that you're the queen. You know, it, I, I'm so happy uh, that, that you're the queen. I, I also think that it, it was wrong to be Protestant. I, I, I'm Catholic now, okay? She pretended to be Catholic. She did everything. And she was lucky. Uh, she was just locked up in the Tower of London. She was kept prisoner, uh, not, not in a dungeon, in a kind of miserable place, in quite in a sense of position of luxury, actually, uh, you know, with servants and comfortable surroundings, but she wasn't free. Okay? Uh, but uh, Mary never actually uh, chopped her head off. So she, because she was careful and clever, Elizabeth lived through this difficult time. But uh, Mary wanted to have a son, because if not, uh, automatically, Elizabeth would be the queen after Mary died, because she was the closest family. So, she needed to marry. And she married Philip of Spain. And this was not very popular with a lot of English people. You see, the law was, when you marry, everything that you have belongs to your husband as a woman. You lose everything, it doesn't belong to you. So she's queen of England, but really uh, the, the boss now is the Spanish king. It's his country now. Uh, people didn't want England to be under Spanish control. Spain was the most powerful country in Europe, and they didn't want to see it becoming even stronger and uh, England coming under Spanish control. Well, that could have happened. 
And uh, because of the risk, there was even uh, one group of people, uh, quite a big group actually, led by a guy called Thomas Wyatt, uh, who tried to prevent the marriage, but he was caught, and, and that, was, you know, that didn't work. Um, they wanted to stop the marriage, but uh, in the end, the marriage happened, and uh, Prince Philip became the King of England and Ireland, which were, by this time was largely under English control. Oh, sorry. Sorry, this, this should have been cut out. Forget that. Yeah, this is what we need next. Um, Mary had uh, a false pregnancy. She stopped having her, you know, monthly periods, and it seemed like she was pregnant. Everybody was expecting uh, a royal birth just two months after her marriage. She... Uh, she appeared to be pregnant, but by July of the next year, it was pretty clear that this was not a real pregnancy. It was what's called a false or phantom pregnancy. And Philip realized that uh, it wasn't a, you know, she wasn't going to have a son. He lost interest then in her. He lost interest in the whole thing. And he went off to France to, to fight uh, Spain's wars with France at that time. Uh, which was kind of, in a way, lucky for England because um, he could have stayed in England to keep control of the country, but, but he didn't. He just went, he just said, oh, forget this, I'm not interested in this. And he went off to fight in, uh, in, in France. Now, remember Henry, and he believed that he, he couldn't have a son because God was angry with him for his marriage. Well, Mary had the same kind of idea, all right? God is angry with me. I've done something wrong. What have I done that made, that's made God angry that I couldn't have a child? Yeah, right. I didn't punish the Protestants when I came in as a Catholic. I should have punished the Protestants. Let's start burning Protestants and then God will be happy with me again. Did you tell anybody? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think they were all a little bit crazy in those days, okay? Um, so uh, that's what she started doing. And as I say, that's what she is mostly remembered for, uh, burning uh, Protestants who were considered heretics at that time. Um, they went against the Catholic religion. And so uh, it started uh, in 1555, uh, Mary probably knew by this time that she wasn't really pregnant. And here we go. These are the names. Mostly men, as you can see, uh, but quite a, lot of, quite a lot of women there as well. Okay, Margaret Maring there, Margaret Thurston there, Cicely Bonds, jo Joyce Lewis, okay, the sister of George Eagle. There's Thomasina Wood, Marjorie Morris. There's a fair sprinkling of women in there. Um, it wasn't just men, uh, people who refused to accept the Catholic religion at that time were taken and uh, burned. Right. So, uh, as I say, these people, the names, the, the situation, the burning, uh, it, it, it had a big influence on the English imagination, on, on English society. There were about 300 of them, and uh, the details of those who died were recorded in a very, very famous book called uh, Acts and Monuments, which is popularly known as the Book of Martyrs uh, by John Fox. John Fox's book was uh, published many times in his lifetime, was published many times after he died. Uh, John Fox's book became almost as important as the Bible. Okay. Look what the Catholics did. All right, it was used uh, as a very, very strong uh, weapon against the, the, the Catholics. So that when Mary when, when Mary died and Elizabeth became queen, uh, that that became uh, kind of 
very, very important book to change people against the Catholic religion and uh, encourage them to accept the Protestant, the Apocryphal of Elizabeth, the Protestant Church. Okay, so that's basically Mary. Got here. So on then to Queen Elizabeth, uh, what is uh, often considered to be the golden age of Tudor England. It's the age of Shakespeare. It's um, the age of some really important changes in England's position. This is when England begins that road that's going to take it towards the British Empire and being the most powerful country in the world by the 19th century. So uh, it's, it's a very formative period. Ruled by... Uh, Queen Elizabeth, known as the, the Virgin Queen, because she, she never actually married, although uh, it's strongly suspected that she was not a virgin, but she never actually married. And yes, uh, there's a little bit of fun creeps in here. Want to see it again? Look at the end of your prints. Okay. Keep you awake. All right. Okay, well, there's no doubt about the first one. Okay. See if you can get all six. Okay. Uh... An extraordinary woman, an extraordinary childhood. These people had extraordinary lives. If you think about, you know, you think about your life, you know, you're born, you go to Hoi Kui, you go to, you know, Shogaku, you go to Shogaku, you go to, you know, um, Juku, and you, you apply to university and you get here. These people had very, very extraordinary lives. Okay. Uh, well, in her case, of course, um, her mother had her head chopped off when she was a little girl, just to start with. She was only three years old, or less than three years old, and at that stage, she was declared to, to be uh, illegitimate by her father, so she, he kind of disowned her. She could have been completely abandoned. But uh, fortunately, there were some people around who, who, who liked or loved the little girl and uh, made sure that she was okay. They looked after her, nurses and teachers and so on, uh, attendants, governesses, all right. Uh, their names are not so important, but, but it's interesting that, that you know, there were women there to support this little girl when the, the father uh, was not interested in her. And she got an extraordinary education. Um, she learned uh, a large number of languages. And then uh, she was educated by two of the most famous teachers of that period, uh, William Grindle, and even more famous, Roger Ascham, who, who wrote books about teaching and who was uh, a famous uh, educator of that period. So she got one of the best educations that, that was available. Um, later on, we'll see that a lot of women had difficulty getting education, so she was uh, in a very privileged position, learning a huge, a large number of languages. By the end, I think she could speak about 10 or 12 languages, more or less perfectly. Okay. Uh, she, she had um, uh, excellent teachers. She was one of the most intelligent um, uh, well-educated women in, in the whole of Europe. By the age of 18, she was recognized 
as a very talented um, and, and um, yeah. We, we can see even now some of the things that, that survive, like this, uh, this little um, translation of uh, a, French, a French text, which she, she wrote, she made the translation by hand. Okay, this is a handwritten book, inside it's all Fidic, I do. Uh, she wrote it by hand when she was 11 years old, and she presented it to, to uh, Catherine Parr, remember, Henry's last... Uh, his last um, wife, the one who lived on after after he died. She also took um, the young uh, Elizabeth and looked after her. So uh, she gave this to Catherine Parr in 1544. Uh, it's believed that she also embroidered the the cover by hand. Okay, it's so, uh, you know it's, you know sewing different types of um, thread to make a, a pattern like that, it's believed that she did that herself at the age of 11. So, uh, she had, as we've said, a very traumatic childhood with the experience of her mother dying uh, in such a violent and terrible way when she was uh, still only two years old. As um, one of her biographers puts it, she would never be able to remember a time when she had not known that her mother had died because her father ordered it. It's a pretty horrific thing to have to grow up with. Mummy had her head chopped off because Daddy said so. And imagine that. Just think about it. Uh, she was probably too young to remember it all, you know, personally, but then a few years later it happened again. Okay? Uh, sorry, I put in the wrong name there. It's not Catherine Howard, it's uh, Catherine. Catherine. Uh, that, that might be wrong, I'll, check, I'll have to check, because there's Catherine Howard and Catherine Park. Not, not quite sure. Um, either that or I made a mistake. And I'll just have to check the names, but uh, I'll check, I'll confirm that. Um, anyway, yes, uh, Henry uh, uh, chopped off the head of his fifth wife, and uh, by this time Elizabeth would be eight years old, she'd be able to remember. And then uh, she went to live with, so, oh, sorry, yes, that was, I think that was right, and yes, it's Catherine Parr, I get confused between those two. Okay, so it's Three of his wives were called Catherine. A uh, bit confusing. Uh, so anyway, um, she went to live with, with Catherine Parr, and then uh, Catherine Parr also married another man, Thomas Seymour, at that stage, and it seems that she was sexually abused by Thomas Seymour. So she had uh, huge traumas growing up. Her father chopping off uh, the heads of her own mother and another of his wives, and then being sexually abused when she was still just a small child. Uh, when people ask, why did Elizabeth never get married? Well, <laughs> well, she didn't have a very good start, did she? Okay, So that may have been one of the reasons why she never actually married. Okay, this must have had a big effect on her. Uh, a little bit more positively, we can say that she was on good terms with her sister Mary and she had a good relationship with her half-brother Prince Edward. So uh, the three of them, uh, the half-brothers, half half-sisters, they, they, they grew up um, in, a, in a fairly close relationship with each other, which, as I say, was useful to her later on um, in the sense that Mary... Uh, was reluctant to uh, chop her head off when Mary herself became queen. And those were, of course, dangerous times for, for Elizabeth. Catherine was, Catherine Parr was a, a powerful protector of her, but then uh, when she died, she got into trouble with this um, Seymour, the husband, uh, 
he was possibly trying to actually marry her at this stage, uh, but he, he himself got into political trouble because he was plotting against his own uh, brother and uh, because Elizabeth had this kind of connection with him, some people were pointing fingers, you too, you Elizabeth, you were involved in this. Okay? Now he's been put to death, but you also have some responsibility. She had to be very clever again to, to argue, no, I'm not connected with this guy. I never, want, I never wanted him around me. Okay? Uh, I certainly didn't have anything to do with this uh, political plot that he made against his brother. Uh, I'm not responsible for that. So that was the first danger she had to, political danger she had to fight off. And then uh, the rebellion against uh, Mary, Thomas Wyatt's rebellion, which I mentioned earlier, uh, she was suspected of being involved in that. Uh, there wasn't any proof, uh, but as I said, she got put into uh, the Tower of London where she was kept prisoner for a while. She survived by being very careful. And uh, as I said, she even accepted uh, Catholicism, or she told Mary that she believed in Catholicism, just to stay alive. Uh, one of her books that she read in prison, uh, this one here, uh, she wrote by hand, she wrote a little verse in here, uh, no, no, that's not, no, no, no crooked leg, no bleared eye, no part deformed, out of kind, nor yet so only half can be as is the inward suspicious mind. I don't know whether she actually showed that to Mary, but what she's saying is that any, any deformity of the body is not so ugly as a suspicious mind, a twisted mind. And basically, it sounds like she's saying that her sister had a twisted mind keeping her locked up in, uh, in prison like that. So probably she kept that secret. If Mary saw it, she might have been pretty angry. Um, but that's a little, uh, little bit of verse written by uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, saying that no, 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 no ugly body is so ugly as an ugly mind. And basically the hint is that she's accusing Mary having an ugly, suspicious mind. Okay. They were, these words were written in her prayer book at the time that she was imprisoned by Mary. Okay, no crooked leg, no bleared eye, no part deformed out of kind, nor yet so ugly half can be, as is the inward, suspicious mind. And then, of course, Mary died and Elizabeth became queen. Because she didn't have a child, there were two possible successors. One was Mary Stuart, the Catholic, uh, better known as Mary Queen of Scots, who was the granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister Margaret, who had married the King of Scotland. Do you remember Henry's sister married a, Scot a Scottish king? Now, this is uh, Mary Okay, there's Mary the first, Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary. Okay, she's dead. And now we have a kind of competition between Elizabeth and Mary, Queen of Scots, the granddaughter of Henry's uh, sister. So Uh, if I put it up here for you, you've got Henry, uh, we've got his sister, okay, their brother and sister, okay, and then you've got uh, Elizabeth, okay, the daughter here, and you've got uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, 
granddaughter. Okay, uh, the um, development between these two is pretty important, and I'll be talking in a fair amount of detail. Uh, Mary, if anything, had an even more extraordinary life than Elizabeth, as we shall find out. There's a religious difference between the two of them. Elizabeth is basically Protestant, and Mary is Catholic. So this puts them in a big political power struggle. Those people who want a Catholic leader of the country support Mary. Those people who want a Protestant leader for the country support Elizabeth. Okay. So, because of the difference in religion, the competition between them uh, becomes very, very important. Mary is a sort of symbol for the Catholic people. They want a Catholic queen. All right. So, this uh, competition between the two of them is going to be a big, a big thing. So, we've got Mary on the one side and Elizabeth on the other. Mary championed by Catholics, Elizabeth by Protestants. Mary's still quite young, she's only 17 years old, uh, and she has spent most of her life in France. Scotland at this time is actually becoming more of a Protestant country, um, and as a result of uh, Scotland becoming more Protestant. Protestant um, countries now were, uh, we had Scotland and England both uh, being basically Protestant. So these two countries were getting closer to each other, Scotland and England. The old uh, enmity, the old hatred between Scotland and England was getting less. And so, uh, at the time when Mary died, France was fighting against Protestants itself inside France. France was still basically a Catholic country. And so uh, didn't have the energy to give uh, support to Mary at that time. Okay, Mary was the, the Scottish queen, but she'd been growing up and living in, in France, which had, if you remember, I said France and Scotland had a strong alliance. Okay. So, uh, because Mary couldn't get enough support at that time, Elizabeth became the Queen of England. So, yes, this is Mary, Queen of Scots. She's known as Mary, Queen of Scots, to make, make the difference between Mary uh, I, or Mary Tudor, the, the Catholic queen who died. Um, she was the main rival of Elizabeth, and uh, in the end, she is beheaded, but not for a long time. In the end, uh, she, she loses her head. Um, but between Mary... Queen of Scots and Elizabeth, we, we really get the, 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 the history of the country uh, starts to change quite considerably. Who is still awake? So... When Elizabeth comes into power, we start with something called the Elizabethan Settlement. Uh, she's apparently crowned her coronation, and she takes the ceremony where she becomes queen. Uh, it, it's all very positive. She's given a warm welcome, uh, and she's accepted as the queen of the country. Uh, seems to have been quite a, a popular thing, and uh, 
there weren't any problems at that stage. So she became queen in 1559, and uh, let's see what her steps are. Uh, the two big questions are going to be, what's going to happen after Elizabeth? She's not married, she doesn't have any children. And what's going to happen to the religion of the country? Now, the religious problem is the first one that she sorts out. It's called the Elizabethan Settlement. Kyo kai no kankei no Elizabethan Settlement. She starts off by making something called an Act of Supremacy. Uh, the Act of Supremacy means everybody in, who has a high-level position in this country must accept me as the leader of the church, not just as the queen of the country, but as the leader of the church. The Act of Supremacy says uh, you can't say that the Pope is the head of the church if you're in a high position in, in my country. If you want to have a, a high position, in, in an important position, you've got to accept that I am the leader of the church. And so uh, then she established something called the Act of Uniformity, which established that it was basically a Protestant church. This is the shape of the church ceremony. This is how the service worked. So these two acts are called the Elizabethan Settlement. This is the time when the church becomes settled as a Protestant church with the king or queen at the head of the church. And Ima Demo, Queen Elizabeth II, is the head of the church, and it's a Kokukyo so Basically, you know, for hundreds of years now, the church has followed that basic uh, position. So uh, it starts really with this Elizabethan settlement. Okay, an act in this case, an act just means a law, a law. As a law passes through Parliament, it's called an act, an act of supremacy, act of uniformity. And together, these two acts, these two laws, are the Elizabethan settlement. You can see Elizabeth here. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, really, when you look at her. Uh, one woman surrounded by men. All right, all the other advisors, all the other politicians, everybody is a man. And... Uh, there she is among all those men, uh, one single woman leading um, basically uh, in, a, in a government of men. And of course, yes, that, that focused a lot on which man will you marry? Mary married, okay, and not popularly, but she married. Uh, which man will you marry? Let's just take a look before we get into the questions of, you know, who she marries. Or, well, she doesn't marry anyone in the end, but, but, but her question of her love life um, and who will come, come after her. Let's look at this church that she established then through the settlement. In addition to establishing the church as a Protestant church, she... She made an important decision that if you disagree with my church, I will not punish you as a heretic. Mary did. Mary burned heretics. Remember what we said, if you die for your religion, it's a, uh, it, it will be burned. And Elizabeth said no more of that, basically. I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, You have to at least do a tatemae for me. You have to accept that I'm the head of the church. You have to come to my church. Uh, but in your heart, I don't want to try to change what's in your heart. I can't, I can't see what's in your heart. And I would, you know, it's not my business. This is between you and your God. Okay, you sort it out. Okay, I'm not going to burn you for it or anything like that. I will put you to death if you betray me as queen. All right? The only crime is the political one, in theory. Okay? Um, 
Catholics, of course, were much were strongly suspected of um, trying to uh, take away, you know, replace the queen and, and have a Catholic ruler. Uh, they were strongly suspected of political activity, but by itself, uh, in theory, uh, just believing in the Catholic religion was not supposed to be a crime. Okay? It, it, it's not as simple as that. If you were a Catholic priest, that was punishable by death. And uh, if you didn't go to the church, you would get it, the, the Protestant church, you would get into trouble. But in theory, uh, uh, she's not punishing people for being heretics anymore. So those burnings come to an end. So the, the crime is not heresy, the crime is treason. And uh, we've got a church now which is trying to uh, attract as many people as possible on both sides. It's saying, look, we're in the middle. We know you Puritans, you Puritans want a much... Uh, uh, simpler church with no ceremonies and, and uh, you want to follow a very basic teaching from the Bible uh, and we know you Catholics you've got your colour and your tradition and your ceremonies and you want all of those look, we're going to keep some of the ceremonies but we're going to make it fairly simple can you, can you please try to compromise and, and come to our church So it, the, she tried to make the church as wide as possible to accept people of both you know, both um, sides of the religious debate try and include as many people as possible. Okay? And basically that works. I mean, in the end, uh, most people did join in with the, with the church and accepted it, the Ekoko Kyokai, the Church of England. Uh, Richard Hooker, if you're interested in the history, uh, we got this man, Richard Hooker, who wrote a huge amount. Uh, there, there were um, eight, eight books uh, this explaining what exactly the Church of England believes. This is our church. This, this is the kind of document that describes and explains what we believe, why we believe. Every little aspect of church teaching is explained in Hooker's book. Okay? Um, I know that for Japanese people it's a little bit difficult to understand. I wish this one asked me how you translate it, Because, you know, if you're, if you're Japanese, you, you Mostly doesn't matter too much, you know. What what do Buddhists believe? Or what do you know? What do Shintoists believe? It's more like you you, you know you go you you are you know respectful and you, you put money in and you get your man or in. It's not about what you believe. But Christianity has always but, but in other countries Buddhism is. You know, if you go to if you go to Thailand and ask people what the Buddhists believe, they know what Buddhists believe. Okay. It's important to the religion, but in Japan, what, what you believe is not really so important. It's, it's more the respect, okay, and, and doing the, you know, ceremonies. Uh, but in Christianity, also, what you actually believe is very, very important. Okay? So, uh, the, the, the church has strong teachings about so many different aspects of our life, morality, behavior, uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, and uh, Hooker wrote down uh, a huge amount explaining what the Church of England believes. Okay, so now let's move on to that question of marriage. Uh, people supposed at the beginning of her reign that she would marry, and their question then was, well, who? Who will she marry? But basically they supposed that she would marry. It was kind of about Tari Mai. Surely she's going to marry. Um, Ro Robert Dudley. Uh, she was close to him. They had they had uh, known each other for a long time, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there was some kind of scandal about Dudley's wife. Uh, uh, the problem was that Dudley was actually married, uh, already married, and uh, there's suspicion that he killed his wife in the hope that he would marry Elizabeth. But the scandal came out, or the suspicion came out, what happened to his wife? They say she fell down the stairs. That's a strange story. Oh, I don't believe that. I think he killed her. 
And so because of this scandal, um, the, the, it was advised by Elizabeth's advisors, the people around her, uh, the advice was, don't marry him. Okay, the people will be angry if you marry him. And then, of course, there were uh, the kings and princes of other countries. Remember, if, if they could marry Elizabeth, there was a chance that they could control England without fighting to control the country. Uh, so um, Philip of Spain was a big one. All right, he'd already, he'd already married Mary, remember. Uh, he tried again with Elizabeth. Um, Eric of Sweden, Charles of Austria, um, a, a number of different uh, princes and kings tried to see if they could win Elizabeth in marriage. Okay, this is Dudley. Uh, they, they knew each other because they were locked up in the Tower of London. They were kept prisoners uh, at the same time, and they stayed close all their lives. But she couldn't, in the end, marry him because, yeah, if you're watching, you will notice something there. Um, they couldn't, in the end, marry him because uh, of this scandal about his wife. Okay, so that's Robert Dudley. Probably he's the person that she was closest to that she would have chosen to marry, uh, except for this scandal about the death of his wife. Then we've got the uh, King of Spain who had married Mary uh, and was still a very important king uh, in, uh, in Europe. The most powerful country in Europe was Spain, and so he was obviously a hugely important person and powerful. So he was uh, a possible choice. But in the end, she never married, and uh, she became known as the Virgin Queen, which, as I say, she probably wasn't. She almost certainly wasn't a virgin. She slept with men, but she didn't marry any of them. So now, let's bring back Mary. What's been happening to Mary all this time? Well, this is a big problem for Elizabeth. What to do with this Catholic who the supporters of the Catholics want uh, to, be, to be the Queen of England? When she was just one week old, okay, yeah, when I say she had an exciting childhood, I mean, she'd be too young to remember it, but at the age of one week, she was declared uh, the Queen of Scotland. And when she was six months old, she was engaged to marry. I mean, goodness, most of us haven't reached when we won't get close to that in our life, okay? But by the time she was six months old, she, she was queen and engaged to marry. How's that? Okay? Um, well, neither of these really worked out very well. Uh, the, um, the Catholics in Scotland... Uh, broke off the match. They didn't want. They didn't want Mary to be marrying uh, a Protestant, and they sent Mary off to as a little girl. They sent her off as a child to France, and she spent most of her childhood growing up in France. Then, when she was fifteen years old, she married. Um, a, a French prince who, who be, uh, at, the age, at the age of 15 she marries the prince a year later he becomes the king and another year later he dies okay? so she's not even your age yet and look at what she's, she's been queen of Scotland she's been engaged to the Henry VIII's son she's, 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 a, she's married a, a French king and she's a widow I mean, compared with, you know, going to university and maybe doing a part-time job, <laughs> this is quite a life, isn't it? All right? So, um, and it, 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 it carries on, okay? Um, the next step is she decides to go back to Scotland, but actually uh, Scotland is now quickly moving towards being a Protestant country 
and as a Catholic queen, she's uh, as a Catholic, she's in uh, in danger in Scotland. This is the man who is moving Scotland in a Protestant direction, John Knox, very important reformer, and uh, he, Scotland is accepting Knox's teaching, and Scotland is taking its own path towards being a Protestant country. So, ha 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 ha, what have we got here? We've got Elizabeth now making a, another interesting move and marrying her cousin, Lord Darnley, Henry Stewart. Well, I'm sorry, I, I almost feel like I'm making up a novel or making it my own, you know. Is, can this really be true, okay? <laughs> he murders her secretary, who is an Italian. Her husband murders her secretary. He's jealous. He, he kills his wife's secretary, this Italian guy. And then, uh, then he himself gets murdered. Okay, so she marries him. He kills another guy that he's jealous, maybe is too friendly with Mary. And then he gets killed. And then what happens? She marries the person who probably killed her husband. Am I making this? I'm not. I, I swear, I'm not making this up. Okay? This is actually what happened. Okay? You couldn't make it up, could you? I mean, it's just. Okay? It's just an amazing story. All right. Um, so then, uh, because she married, she she then married the man who probably killed her husband. The people are just, what's going on in this country? We can't have a queen who's doing this kind of thing. So. Um, she had to escape from Scotland at that time. Uh, she, she ran off to England and said to Elizabeth, Elizabeth, please look after me. I'm in trouble in Scotland. They want to kill me or they want to do something awful to me because, you know. So she goes to Elizabeth for help. Elizabeth thinks, oh my God. You're the person that half of this country wants to be queen. You're my, you're my enemy. Okay, I, I can't look after you. I can't help you. Uh, Elizabeth is really put in a very difficult position. Uh, at this time, uh, notice that the, the uh, King of Scotland now becomes the one-year-old uh, child of Mary, uh, James VI. He will be important to us later on. He's going to grow up and become King of England. So, as I say, it's a fantastic story. You couldn't make this stuff up. And uh, it, it keeps on going. Mary thought that Elizabeth was going to help her to get back her throne as the Queen of Scotland, but Elizabeth was really much more worried about the risk that Mary posed to her own position as Queen of England. Okay, no, I can't help you to get back your throne in Scotland. I'm worried about, you know, English Catholics supporting you to, to, to replace me. And... There were indeed many plots to kill Elizabeth, and Mary was the champion of the Catholics. They wanted her as the queen instead of Elizabeth. So it was much too dangerous for Elizabeth to let Mary go free. She wasn't Ijiwaru. Elizabeth wasn't nasty like her father. You know, she didn't just kill people for fun or something. But uh, she, kept, she had to do something, and she kept Mary uh, in a kind of prison. Actually, very luxurious. You know, with ser again, with servants, and, you know, she was very free. She just, uh, she just wasn't allowed to go away. So she just had to stay uh, as a kind of permanent guest, if you like. Uh, but in the end, they found evidence that she was positively involved in a plot to kill Elizabeth. So uh, nearly 20 years later, uh, she was put to death. Okay, there she is. That's her head. Well, it's not her head. It's a painting of her head. Um, she was supposed to be one of the most beautiful women in England, so uh, it was shocking that when her head was held up, 
Uh, it was a capsule that her hair was not her real hair, it was a wig. Okay? Um, it's also famous, or it, it, it quite often happened that the executioner didn't do a good job. I think he didn't kill her first time round. Um, it's a nasty, nasty business. And this then led, uh, uh, I don't know if we're going to have time quite to finish this, but the King of Spain had been very patient with Elizabeth all through this period. Uh, he's Catholic, she's Protestant, she's attacking, you know, English ships are attacking Spanish ships when they come back from America, bringing um, treasures from America, and Philip is saying, it's okay, all right, okay, well, I'm not very happy that you're doing that, but please do not do that. Uh, and then finally, he realizes she's never going to marry me. She's never going to agree. You know, she's never going to stop doing these things against me. Uh, so finally, after the Catholic Mary is put to death by Elizabeth, the Catholic Philip decides war. Okay, I'm going to fight this woman. Okay, he'd been very patient for a long time. He was patient when she didn't marry him. He was patient when English ships attacked the Spanish ships coming back from America. And he was patient when, up to a point when she made an alliance with Protestant rebels in, in a part of um, Europe, the Netherlands, um, Oranda, uh, which was under Spanish control. But when, when Mary was beheaded, he finally decided, no, I can't be patient any longer. And so he sent his ships, 